They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. This is the Writer's Room brought to you by Keeneland. It's 9.02 on Wednesday, July 27th. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, filling in for Joe Bianca this week, who's on vacation. And I caught some news this week. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but what's going on at TVG, and it's going to be renamed, uh, TVG is going to be renamed, excuse me, FanDuel Television. And at night, they're going to show Korean football pickleball and Chinese basketball. If you're tuning in to FanDuel TV at night to bet on Korean football, you need help out. <laughs> Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I actually want to be very sincere in my intro this time. It's going to be my father's birthday on Saturday. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say to my dad, thank you for being a mentor and a sounding board and, and a friend over the years. And in so many ways, I'm so happy that you're my father. Um, and the only person who's even happier than you being my dad is my therapist. So for my <laughs> therapist and I, dad, happy birthday. Yeah, we love Len Green. By the way, I want to remind you that the uh, Writers Room podcast is brought to you each and every week by uh, Keeneland. And this November, Keeneland is the place to be as the home of the Breeders' Cup World Championships, followed directly by the November Breeding Stock Sale. Entry deadline is August 1st. Learn more at november.keeneland.com. So, John, let's get into the big races over last weekend. And obviously, we have to start off with Monmouth Park and the Haskell, the TVG.com Haskell. And a mild upset in there, Cyberknife, a legitimate horse, a grade one winner in the Arkansas Derby, but most people thought it was going to be a race that came down to either Taba or Jack Christopher, the two heavy favorites in the race. I couldn't see anybody else winning. Cyberknife wins, Taba second, Jack Christopher third. The story is as much Cyberknife as it is Jack Christopher. I had been on this horse's bandwagon since day one, as have a lot of people. He's not a bad horse. It wasn't a bad race. But clearly what we found out about him is he's not a two-turn mile and eighth horse. Think of him as another Jackie's Warrior, and Jackie's Warrior is a tremendous horse. But what did you think in particular of uh, Jack Christopher and the Haskell? Yeah, you know, those three horses, uh, Jack Christopher, Cyberknife, and, and Taba, were definitely the ones that were in the spotlight heading into the gate for this race. Uh, and, you know, Jack Christopher showed exactly what he is, which is a phenomenal sprinter, absolutely phenomenal one-turn horse. Uh, son of Munnings. And, uh, you know, Chad Brown has done a really good job of trying to eat the horse into a mile and a mile and an eighth. Um, unfortunately, he just doesn't have the ability at this level, at a grade one level to to get to that point. But I can't wait to continue to see Jack Christopher. Um, rumors are he's going to run in the, in the Allen Jerkins and then, uh, you know, maybe the, the Breeders' Cup sprint. I'm sure there's going to be a race in between. But he is a phenomenal athlete and a phenomenal horse and added a lot of spice to this race. And the other spicy part of the race was the last 16th of a mile, uh, because it looked like that for, you know, for a brief second that Taba, the son of gun runner, the $1.7 million yearling, uh, excuse me, two-year-old purchase, was going to hit the wire first. And, you know, hats off to to, uh, to Giroux, who did such a phenomenal job on Cyberknife of, of finding the hole in the rail, getting up there, um, you know, through the hole and uh, coaxing Cyberknife to, to a victory. So, you know, the, the race started off with those three as spotlighted. And I think it ended, you know, with conversations about all three. And and Bill, I think you also have to have a, a big conversation about Gunrunner, about this young sire, son of, of Candy Ride, who uh, has had horses that have run in and won greatest stake races throughout the country um, and throughout North America. And and now here's another latest example of Gunrunner having the exacta in the grade one Haskell between Cyberknife and Taba. John, uh, another observation about the race. I, I thought Taba ran a huge race. And if you looked on the turn, he was backpedaling. He was going in the wrong direction. I thought he was done at that point. And then it looks like what happened was that he didn't like being in between horses down towards the inside. When Mike Smith got him out into the clear, he took off and, and put in another gear, taking nothing away from Cyberknife. But I think all things being equal, uh, you know, maybe Taba was the better horse. Yeah, and, and that's horse racing um, because not always, you know, the best horse doesn't always hit the wire first. Sometimes you get in traffic problems. And, and you know, lest we forget, Taba not only hadn't run since the Kentucky Derby, which was early in May, obviously, um, but this was only his fourth career start. So, you know, you're asking a horse to do so much when you're asking him to win a grade one race. And Taba had to ship, you know, cross country, 
running a racetrack he'd never run before. Again, it was only his fourth start of his career. Um, Mike Smith hadn't been on him since the Kentucky Derby. So there's asking a lot of these horses. And even though they paid seven figures for the horse, it doesn't necessarily mean that that you're going to get um, not only ability, but you're, you're also going to get maturity. And, and that happens. You need a horse to, to have four, five, six you know, races under his belt to do things like this, like go between horses. And I really think that's one of the reasons why Cyberknife was able to hit the hole in the rail and, and go up there because this is his ninth start and, and he's a seasoned veteran, um, you know, especially compared to, uh, to Taba. Yeah, uh, Taba will not run in the Travers because Bob Baffert is not allowed to run horses as we speak in Saratoga because of Naira's ban. So we'll see where he comes back. Pennsylvania Derby would sound like a logical spot for him as uh, there's no problems having Baffert run his horses um, at parks. Now, the other big story of the day was Chad Brown. And, you know, sometimes I think we take this guy for granted because he's so good and does so much. So he entered in six races on the card. Going into the Haskell, he had won all five of them. It started off in the allowance race, then highly motivated, won the Monmouth Cup. Lamista wins the Windstar matchmaker. Search results wins the Molly Pitcher. And then uh, Adamo won the grade one UN. And, you know, what struck me, John, is, you know, here's a guy who won four graded stakes races going into the Haskell. And he more or less brought his junior varsity to Monmouth. I mean, you know, Adamo is a good example. This is a horse that had lost eight straight starts and was 0-3 since coming in uh, to the, the States from France. And, you know, he got the job done in, in the grade one race. And, you know, this guy just his the depth of his operation is getting to the point. It's unlike anything we've ever seen. I mean, you could literally look down at the 25th, 30th best horse in his barn. And that's at the very least a grade two winner. But then only Chad Brown could win. Uh, five day races on the day and four grade one races and probably went home disappointed because of the uh, fact that Jack Christopher didn't win the race. And Jack Christopher of all that group looked like his most likely winner. But, you know, you just you just wonder. I, I mean, this guy is good as he has been over the years. I think his table's getting stronger every year. It looks like it. And, and a lot of that build, I think, is because of his European presence. Um, he's bringing over good horses or his owners are buying and bringing over some really talented horses. Um, and Adamo is just the most recent one. Uh, and you mentioned that, you know, if he's junior varsity for Chad Brown, you know, what is he over in, in, in Ireland? I mean, you know, and we've seen a lot of Euros come here um, and win big races and, and including Breeders' Cups over the past couple of years. But yeah, it, it's an embarrassment of riches for a guy like Chad Brown. And not only, you know, was he a little disappointed, I'm sure, about the fact that Jack Christopher you know, didn't hit the, didn't win, I should say. Um, but I'm sure he's disappointed that he's not our guest of the week. I mean, what do you have to do to, to be the goddamn guest of the week here? You know, you, you got to go. You, you got, we have high standards here. You got to go six for six. Exactly. That, that's it. You were so close. Chad, you were this <laughs> close. I swear to you. Um, but I also want to, you know, we, we, we talk about these super trainers and, and all the great things that, that, that they've done with, with their talented bench and everything like that. Um, but can I shift gears for a second to, to an up and coming sure. trainer? Um, you know, Kent Sweezy who, you know, has, has had a couple of horses for us over the years, um, has done a good job with his win percentage and, and improving his barn. He took Epic Bromance um, and ran second in the United Nations on his on his home turf, uh, literally on his home turf at Monmouth Park. Um, but here's a guy who's a, a young, you know, uh, guy from Kentucky. He didn't want to go into consigning like, like his dad, went into training because that was his true love. And now he's picking up horses and, and Epic, Epic Bromance you know, recently was in Kelly Breen's barn and Mark Cassie's barn. And yet Kent Sweezy was important enough for him. And, and he, he, he got, he figured out the horse, you know, uh, as far as how he could get a mile and three eighths, you know, for the, in the United Nations. And he ran a very credible second in that race with a horse that, you know, was a claiming horse um, and, and that uh, Sweezy has improved upon. So, you know, we, we want to highlight not only the big trainers, but also some of the smaller guys that, that do well. And I, I think, you know, Ken Sweezy is a guy who is an up and coming trainer in this business. Yeah, I believe that horse was 70 to one. So a good performance there, uh, certainly to finish second. OK, let's go over to Saratoga, where the big race on Saturday was the coaching club American Oaks. Uh, another it essentially was a match race, it, it, only five horses in the race. But, you know, if you're going to have only a five horse field, you it, it, it certainly helps to have the two best three year old fillies in the country. And going into the race, I think there was some uh, debate who was the better horse, Secret Oath. Or um, Nest, the last time they had met was in the Kentucky Oaks when um, Secret Oath beat Nest. There's no doubt about it now. I mean, absolutely, Nest put on a show. She wins by 12 and a quarter length. She just absolutely thrashed Secret Oath. And, you know, here's a horse by Curlin who was 
good coming into this race and I think moved up to a next level and is getting better all the time. She really is. I mean, this was a wow race. Uh, and, and you mentioned it was a five horse field, which, Bill, I know you're going to love this. It is is still 20 percent more than the Honorable Miss, the grade two Honorable Miss that's running this afternoon. But it's a four horse field. Um, but you're looking at, at a very talented, albeit small group of, of fillies um, that ran in the Coaching Club America Oaks. Nest, I think, easily stamped herself as the, uh, the top three year old filly in the country. And rightfully so. She put on just a tremendous show, had an extra gear down the stretch uh, that nobody else in the race had. And don't forget, this is nine furlongs and she's accelerating, you know, down the stretch. I mean, that was and I'm not comparing her to Secretariat, but it was kind of Secretariat-esque as far as how much more talented she was than the rest of this field, for example. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind that she didn't just win by 12 and a quarter lengths. She, she beat the Kentucky Oaks winner by right. 12 and a quarter lengths. All right, so Sunday at Saratoga, again, a four-horse field in the Shoe V. But again, if you're going to have a small field, it ha certainly helps to have some stars in there. And the rematch between Clarier and Malathat was actually the sixth time these two fillies have run against each other. And it started off last year as all Malathat. She finished ahead of Clarier all four times they've met. But Clarier, once again, I mean, superiority was proven on the racetrack, trained by Steve Asmus, and she got the job done. And, um, you know, we'll see how Latruska does when she comes back. Looks like she's going to be ready for the um, personal ensign later in the meet. Right now, Clarier leads this division. She does. And, and Bill, what a great group of older mares uh, that are coming to, into form at the right time. Uh, you're talking about some of the top ones that, that you mentioned. Latruska obviously is coming back. Um, you'd like to think that she would be able to come back to her top form, um, although we did talk about her a little bit on a previous show that maybe, um, you know, that she's on the on the downswing of, of her uh, overall career. Uh, but you're talking about those kind of fillies and mares. And then uh, the fact that they're going to be up against some of the, the top three year old fillies that we just talked about with with Nest and Secret Oath. And I mean, th this three year old filly, excuse me, this Breeders Cup distaff is really shaping up to be quite a race. Yeah, it certainly is. So that was the Shoe V Sunday at uh, Saratoga. Big weekend of racing highlighted by the Haskell. And I uh, want to remind you that Keeneland sales graduates were in the winner's circle this past weekend. Headlined by the Grade 1 Coaching Club American Oaks winner Nest was a $350,000 purchase for Eclipse Thoroughbred Partners and Rapoli Stables. Other graded stakes winning Keeneland graduates include Grade 3 Molly Pitcher Stakes Victor Search Results, Grade 3 Monmouth Cup Stakes Winner Highly Motivated, and Grade 3 Henry Stakes Winner, that's up at Woodbine, Hazelbrook. Your next opportunity awaits at the Keeneland September Sale, which starts Monday, September 12th. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. When the thoroughbred world descends upon Lexington this November, there is one place you need to be. The place where history comes alive with every championship victory. He's off the dick indeed! The place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel. The place that exists to be the heart of this industry. The center of it all. Home to the November breeding stock sale and the 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. He was just put together like a machine and he had a great mind. Everything about him was what you'd want. Tis the law, pops the cork and the champagne. Tis the law is going to win the first leg of the Triple Crown. I've never seen him get tired. Respect the law, tis the law. His structure is just perfect. His bone is perfect. He's left the others behind. He's going to win the run, Happy Travers. He's everything you would look for in a horse. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore, and the impressive winners keep coming for Triple Crown winner Justify. On Friday, his son, Just the Warrior, scored a five-length debut victory at Ellis Park. There was a one-two finish for Coolmore Sire Juveniles at Saratoga on Sunday when Kayleen, a daughter of Practical Joke, led home a Justify filly named Rarify in the maiden special weight race. Kayleen was named a TDN Rising Star, while her sire, Practical Joke, now has 43 winners in 2022 and leads the class of second prop sires. So, John, um, in the news this week was a, a story that I, I think, well, I'll give you, the first of all, the nuts and bolts, but I think we need to go look behind the curtain a little bit. Um, there was a, a report from a website called Legal Sports Report that reported there's going to be some major changes at TVG, in, likely in September, starting with a rebranding and rename. TVG is going to be renamed Fan Duel Television 
and TVG2 is going to be renamed FanDuel Racing. FanDuel, of course, is the parent company that owns TVG and is huge in the uh, online sports betting market, daily fantasy sports whatsoever. Now, um, the report said that from, I guess, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., it's going to be all sports wagering talk. Then they're going to do racing with some live cut-ins during the day. Presumably, you know, someone may come in and say, um, you know, Kyrie Irving is hurt tonight. So keep that in mind when you want to bet on the Nets or something like that. Uh, and then from 9 p.m. on, they're going to go back to uh, uh, the sports talk and have, uh, again, you can't make this up, Korean football, pickleball, and Chinese basketball. So, you know, on the surface, if that's all that's going to happen, I don't think there's any reason to panic, but I think you've got to look beyond this a little bit. And if they're going to rename TVG FanDuel TV, doesn't, and then rename TVG to FanDuel Racing, that makes me believe that they've got bigger plans here and that eventually TVG is going to become a 24 7 sports wagering network. Now, the problem is that if everything goes to TVG2 racing-wise, and I looked all over the internet, I tried to get some statistics on the availability of TVG2 and TVG and number of households in the country. I couldn't find anything. But I can tell you, I don't get TVG2. I don't know if you do. Um, I know I, I know very few people that get it. If, in fact, you know, maybe I'm, I'm just, um, you know, panicking for no reason. But if, in fact, that's what they do, if TVG2 becomes the racing channel and, and TVG becomes the sports betting channel, I think that's a big blow for racing. Yeah, it, it almost looks like they're setting up for a decoupling situation. Right. And if they do set up for a decoupling situation, then um, we're going to lose as an industry in this divorce proceeding. Um, but the fact that, that they have, you know, FanDuel TV and FanDuel Racing um, established in the short term, I think is good news because at least then we'll have, uh, you know, a way to, to get to the masses and, and still be in the public eye. Um, I think that the TVG two is part of like a special sports package. So if you get the, uh, if you get the, the, the Mercedes Benz, mm -hmm. uh, you know, package for sports, then you get the, uh, TVG two thrown in there. I know like we have it, um, and, and we have it so I can watch some of these races around the country. But unfortunately, if we even if we only go down to one channel as an industry, um, there's going to be a, an issue with showing races because we still have so many racetracks and so many of them overlap as far as post time goes. So right now with the two channels, yeah, you can watch um, races that, that are going in, you know, almost in sync at the same time and still get some commentary, pre-commentary and post-race commentary on it. Um, I fear that if we're only going to have the one channel, it's basically going to be like speed dating. And every two minutes, you're going to have a different racetrack and you're going to be able to watch the race. And pretty much as soon as that race, you know, the sources hit the wire, they're going to flip over to the to the next race that's coming up, because I think that's what the general public wants. They want to have that instant action. Now, for people like us who want to analyze the races, um, it's going to be to our detriment. We're going to have to have other sources. But, you know, FanDuel is stepping up not only by buying this channel, but uh, Bill, I don't know if you saw some of the celebrities and some of the people they're bringing on to actually, uh, you know, talk on, on be the talking heads of some of these shows that they have. Um, Kay Adams, who, you know, basically was was the anchor for Good Morning Football for years and years and years, um, basically left that job to come over to, to be a part of FanDuel. And there's other really high profile people that are coming. It's almost too bad that None of them are Randy Moss or none of them are somebody that can highlight our industry a little bit as well. But, um, you know, it, it looks like in the short run, I think it's going to be, you know, a positive thing. But, Bill, I'm, I'm concerned also that in the long run, we're going to be like the redheaded stepchild of, yeah. of this uh, merger. I mean, that's the other thing, you know, um, the woman you mentioned, and I'm not familiar with that. I don't watch NFL uh, TV, but apparently she's a big deal. They didn't bring her in. So just so that she'd be on at eight o'clock in the morning and, and, and that would be talking about point spreads and, and that sort of thing. But John, I think there's a bigger issue here too. And, uh, you know, when sports betting came in, um, you know, my prediction was eventually this is going to be a big problem for horse racing. And the reason why is, is I think is obvious. If you, up till the, the, the pass of, of uh, the Supreme Court uh, striking down the prohibition on sports betting in this country, racing was, had the monopoly of being the only game you could legally wager on online. Now, not only does it have a mon not have a monopoly, it's competing against something that is uh, 
immensely more popular than horse racing. I mean, you know, the NFL, NBA, NHL, et cetera, uh, Major League Baseball. And also, I think there's a factor that, you know, how are you going to get young people interested in gambling on racing when they have this other option? And I think this is the type of thing that we're going to see. I mean, it, it, sports betting hasn't bulldozed racing. It hasn't caused, at least so far, any major problems and handle handles doing just fine. But, you know, this is the type of thing that I worry that, you know, the emphasis would so switch to sports betting that racing would be left behind. If, in fact, TVG is going to become a sports betting wagering channel. This is exactly the type of thing I was talking about and worried about. And, and, and we've seen it time and time again, where um, when you have casino, race casinos, you know, you mm -hmm. have the racetrack that are casinos and you walk through them, 95% of the people who are there don't even know there's races going on, let alone that they're at a racetrack. Um, and, and, you know, that, that in the long run, um, really spells for a problem, especially for some of the smaller racetracks um, that, that have racinos. And, and this isn't helping. Um, but, but Bill, I think it, it's going to be a, a, a situation where it's either going to galvanize us as an industry and make us realize that we need to, again, continue to get our act together and, and, you know, and, and have a singular voice and a singular set of rules and, and enough of the, the, the fiefdom um, protection you know, mode that, that we as an industry have, have been in for the past you know, umpteen years. Um, or we're going to sink because basically these other popular um, industries are going to lap us and make it to the point where people don't really care about horse racing. And the people who do care about horse racing um, are no longer in a position to either gamble or, or even to buy horses because they're just not alive anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it, it's a concern, but we still have time. It's almost like, uh, you know, the, the, um, you know the, the climate issue right now. You know, there's still time to fix it. But it means that we all better get our shit together and, and start planning and, and, and doing rather than just kind of kicking the can down the road. Well, one place where they do have their expletive together is Del Mar. And the last week we talked about the big numbers that came out of Saratoga during opening weekend. So Del Mar opened uh, a week after Saratoga, a little bit unusual there, a different schedule this year. Is they're going past um, Labor Day for the first time perhaps ever? I, I don't know. But on the Friday card opening day, they handled 23.56 million. That was a record. Also, I didn't even realize they did this. They uh, limited attendance. It was a sellout. You couldn't just go in and have an unlimited crowd. I guess they were worried that over the years it got too crowded. Their lines were too long, whatever. So it was a sellout. 21,680 people. Then for the entire three-day weekend, they averaged 22.35 million. Another record field size, 10.6 runners in a race. Again, now talking about the phenomenons of racing. You know, every time we talk about Saratoga, Del Mar, the, the uh, big days like the Breeders' Cup, the Kentucky Derby days, et cetera, Kentucky Downs, they're always, it seems, every single meet setting new records, handle records, et cetera. However, racing as a whole, at least this year, handle is flat. It's not going up. Went up a little bit last year. So I, I think what we're seeing here is, you know, we're not getting more dollars bet as a whole. We're seeing people just, you know, can't get enough of these great racetracks and these great signals. So, you know, I think the same guy who might have been betting on Delaware Park on a Saturday now saying, what am I doing this for? I'm going to be betting on Saratoga, et cetera. So, you know, I, as a whole for an industry, I, I don't know if, if it's doing us that much good. But if you focus on these racetracks in particular, I mean, business is great. It keeps getting better. But again, I think, you know, the, here's the message. Look at what we talked about at Del Mar, beautiful racetrack. Um, great racing and uh, quality racing, high class fields and field size of 10.6 runners per race. I mean, the, the formula is, is very simple. Now, I know everybody can't do this. I mean, Mountaineer Park is not going to average 10.6 runners a race and have great allowance races and have, you know, uh, great stakes races, et cetera. But the public has spoken. Give us what we want. Give us great racing, big fields. Take out of Del Mar, I guess, is OK. It's not particularly low. It's not particularly high, but they're not ripping anybody off with 25 percent takeouts on the pick, whatever. And they will respond. If the product is done right. The public laps it up. They really do. And, and Bill, out of all the numbers you mentioned, the field size average, 10.6 runners per race is tremendous. I mean, we talk all the time about how small fields most of these graded stake races are. And, and Del Mar put together, you know, it's just a phenomenal card uh, for their weekend. And to average ten and a, more than 10 and a half starters per race 
is really outstanding. And that's what the public wants. The public wants to have more options in, in great racing and all the things you mentioned. But by having that number of horses on average in each race, it allows the racetrack to offer more betting options. So when you have a 10 or 11 horse field, you can offer the trifectas and the superfectas and the pick fours and the pick fives. And people will you know, run to that opportunity, especially in comparison to other racetracks where they're not getting that many um, horses in a race and, and they're not getting that many options to bet. So I think, again, we're seeing more and more of these super tracks coming together. And a super track doesn't necessarily mean the biggest, um, but, but super meets, I guess, mm -hmm. is probably the better way of saying it, where you have a big weekend um, with lots of great stake races. And they were fortunate to have good weather. And, uh, and, and that's why they got the record. And whether it's that or whether it's Keeneland uh, for the, the four week meet that they have or Kentucky Downs, it seems like that people love to have these one offs of going to the track and, it, and it's an event. And it's almost like going to a baseball game or a football game. Um, actually, it's better than going to a Red Sox game because at least you have a chance to win. But they, they go to these kind of like one off events and they're seeing it as this is an entertainment. This is what I'm going to do on a Saturday instead of going to a restaurant or going to a show or going to, you know, to, to hang out with with my, you know, with my friends at a barbecue. Um, they're they're basically saying I'm taking my vacation entertainment dollars and I'm going to go to the racetrack because there's 11 horses in, in every race and I have a chance to have fun and, and uh, you know, have a good afternoon. Yeah. And what's remarkable, too, is, you know, Santa Anita is known for having, unfortunately, very small fields. It's the same circuit, but we're also seeing what the horsemen are doing now with both Saratoga and Delmar. They point for these meets. They know their owners are going to come out, bring all their friends. There's, you know, going to be adult beverages being passed around. And I think we're seeing, you know, a guy at Belmont the last couple of weeks at Belmont say, you know what, do I really want to run in this allowance race when it's in the book for the second week at Saratoga? So, you know, you're getting the 10.6 starters per race. Uh, first of all, because you do get out of town outfits to come in Delmar for the ship and win program. But, you know, the regular horsemen and the same thing in New York, as I said, point for this meet because everybody wants to win at Delmar. Everybody wants to win at Saratoga because that's where the spotlight is. But, you know, great job by the racing department there. And, you know, we'll see how it goes throughout the rest of the meet. But I'm sure it'll be uh, more of the same. OK, John. Yeah, Bill, Bill, let me just let me just jump in for one more thing. She actually brought up a very good point, which is everyone wants to win at those racetracks. I know from a breeding standpoint. Um, if you get black type at Saratoga, at Keeneland, at Del Mar, that weighs much heavier than getting black type at other racetracks because people know that you really have to have your A game on um, in order to, to finish first, second or third in a stake race um, during those uh, tremendous meets. So it, it's, it, it permeates through all aspects of the industry. If you win at Del Mar, you win at Saratoga, you hit the board in a stake race um, at, at Keeneland, you know, et cetera, and even at the championship meet at Gulfstream. Um, that has a great amount of weight when it comes to uh, what shows up on your pedigree page when you're selling that horse or when you're selling progeny of that family. All right, so let's switch gears now and talk about the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority and Act. Back in the news again, and uh, you know this fight keep continues. The, the people, the sides that are anti-HISA scored a major victory in court this week. A uh, federal judge in Louisiana granted a preliminary injunction um, that will halt the implementation of HISA in the two states that were part of the, the lawsuit, the plaintiffs in West Virginia and Louisiana. So, um, and what the judge decided is that we'll have an injunction until the, the case is finally decided, the, the lawsuits being brought up about whether or not it is unconstitutional or not um, will be decided in the court. So, you know, a win there. So as we speak, uh, HISA is not in place in West Virginia and Louisiana. And a couple of thoughts on this, but first of all, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know, but I wonder if now other states will pick up on this and, you know, have the precedent of a judge saying, um, you know, we're gonna give you an, an injunction. And there's, you know, several other states and, and, and uh, horsemen's groups out there that have uh, argued that this should be uh, halted. So we'll see if it, it's gonna hit more states. But John, what was your first reaction when, uh, you, you saw that this judge has, has put the brakes on HISA in these two states. Yeah, I was I was really disappointed. Um, and, and again, as an industry, we've shown time and time again that we just can't legislate uh, and, and govern ourselves. So we need to have an adult in the room to do it. Now, is HISA the adult in the room? Um, I, I don't know, but I know that it is a set of rules uh, that that have been you know gone over and, and certainly implemented and accepted begrudgingly, but accepted mm -hmm. by 
the majority of, of the horsemen in the industry. Um, my, but then I, after reading through some of the articles on here, I, I kind of have a better understanding of why uh, Judge uh, Doty um, in Louisiana issued the, uh, the preliminary injunction. And Bill basically came down to, to three different um, circumstances. Uh, number one, he said that as far as being unconstitutional, these are the three items. He wrote that the definition of a horse by Heisa um, exceeds the definition of the statute. So basically he's saying that, you know, what you're, what Heisa, what you're saying is a covered animal um, shouldn't be a covered animal. And I don't know if I didn't read the, the 28 page summary, but I don't know if that meant that it has to be a horse on a covered racetrack and not on these training facilities or, or what exactly to the definition that he was concerned about. But that's number one. Number two, and I think this is a big deal for a lot of people. Um, is that Heisa has the authority to seize records of any person covered by the act. Now, I have spoken to other attorneys and they've told me that it's not a matter of the FBI knocking on the door and saying, we think you may have given a horse, uh, a covered horse, an illegal substance. So we're going to come in and raid your office and raid your house and turn it upside down. I, I don't think it's, it's, it gives them that kind of leverage and, and authority. Um, but people always get worried when it comes to you can't come into my house and tell me what to do or look for things that I do behind my closed doors. Um, and that, you know, I understand that that is a concern of of, uh, of of the mass group. And then the third reason why he said it was unconstitutional has to do with the funding aspect of it, where basically he is saying that West Virginia and Louisiana um, relative to racetrack, or excuse me, states like California, Kentucky, New York, um, that their purse sizes are so much smaller and therefore they should pay an exceedingly smaller amount in the funding of HISA. Um, and, and I think that that last part is, is not going to be conducive to other, you know, larger state racing authorities because they do have higher purses and therefore based on the formula, they can't really fight that, that fight. But I, I really think that, that it's the second part, um, that is the concern of, Horsemen and and people in general, as far as they don't want to have somebody you know knocking on their door saying that they can come in and 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 search um, their premises. And I think that the the definition of the horse coverage that can be modified, um, you know, to to uh, to appeal to everyone else. But yeah, I was I was disappointed with the first group. My initial thought also, Bill went to yours, which is our other states going to copycat this and and start to you know, ask for preliminary injunctions from their local establishment. And that's a concern. Um, I was also a little disappointed with Eric Hamelbach's, um, uh, you know, uh, comment on it. He's the CEO of the National Horseman's Benevolent Protection Association. Um, and he basically said, this is further proof, proof as why HISA can't work and should be reevaluated. And I understand where Eric is coming from in the sense that we're all frustrated about the rules and how quickly they were implemented. And, you know, did people have a proper amount of time to have a say in what was going on and who was at the table making the rules? I understand all that. But if you're representing the National Horsemen's Association, which you are, um, this is an opportunity for you to come in and say, instead of saying, Heisa sucks, maybe you say, the rules are there. We have to abide by them. We would like to have, if you know, a, a, a voice in this matter um, when it comes to having everything reevaluated going forward. Um, but instead, he, he framed his his comment like "Isa sucks" and "I told you so," and, mm -hmm. and that's not a great look. I don't know if that was really his message, but that that's what resonated with me as somebody who is a part of the National Horsemen's Association. Was that our our leader again is kind of spouting out things that are anti rules and, and what's best for the industry. I don't think that was his intention. I don't know. Um, but it, that, that also disappointed me a little bit as well. Um, because again, the bottom line is we're, we're children. We can't, we, we, we can't be um, uh, expected to be able to rule ourselves. We've tried to do that and we failed miserably. Right. You know, and, and honestly, I don't get it. Uh, really what we're talking about here, the Horse Race Integrity and Safety Act, is an effort on part of the industry to make, just like the word say, make horse racing safer and ensure that there is as much, you know, that, that there is less cheating, that integrity is, is taken very, very seriously. Um, and to, not to do so by, you know, the 37 different racing commissions, but under one central group, which is obviously a much more uh, sensible way to go about things. I, I don't see why anybody would be against that. HISA has been in place since July 1st. And has it, what has it meant? What has it done to the industry? You don't, there's nothing, you don't notice that 
anything is any different. But, you know, the vitriol and the hysteria of these people, I, I just, it's, it's off the charts. So this is from T.D. Thornton's report in the Thoroughbred Daily News. He said, all plaintiffs allege they will suffer injuries, quote, in the form of vast destruction of the horse racing industry. In the form of vast destruction of the horse racing industry through individual penalties and systematic changes to the longstanding regulatory structure and revenue model. They argue that there will be financial costs so great that numerous participants will be driven out of the business if the rules are enforced. I mean, that's just nonsense. Complete not. I know, you know, you, that's what you know, people do, they, they want to uh, state their case and they don't mind, uh, you know, the, if, if hyperbole is they, they think is going to help them. <laughs> but, uh, come on, the vast destruction of the horse racing industry. Give me a break. I suppose if we don't adopt these rules, we'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing we've, we've talked about it before from the Eric Hamelbacks of the world. If they're going to be so against this, I would like to hear them say, Here's a better way of doing it. We don't ever yeah. hear that. We just say we're against this. So, I, I mean, I honestly don't get it. You know, why? I, like, you know, John, you would know better than me because you're a quote unquote covered person. I'm not. You know, maybe there are some problems here and there. Maybe it's inconvenient, et cetera. Um, you know, some of the concerns that you brought up earlier, um, I think a lot of those have been addressed. I, I think some of the things people have been claiming, uh, you know, the others are saying are, are not true. But you know, at the end of the day, this is going to go through. Most experts say that it is constitutional. A couple uh, lawsuits have already been lost by these uh, the groups that say it's not constitutional. But, you know, I like I said, I just don't get it. And I read the vast destruction of the horse racing industry. You know, should I laugh or should I cry there? Yeah, yeah it's it, uh, it, whatever. It, um, you know, I've got yeah. a little bit of uh, Hessa, Hissa. Uh, headaches from the overload and just uh, in all that. So we shall see where this goes, but um, not a good week for the, uh, the the people that are pro HISA and on that side. Um, want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. And the early nominations are in for the first leg of the PHBA's two-year-old PA bred PA sired stallion series on Monday, August 22nd. They have over 42 year olds nominated for the $100,000 whistle pig stakes, five and a half furlongs, and over 30 fillies nominated for the Miss Blue Tie Dye at the same distance. So those two races look like they're shaping up to be some exciting contests. Last week, Pennsylvania bred Baron successfully took on Open Company to win in the Frank DeFrancis Memorial Dash at Laurel. And this horse has a really cool story behind him. His co owner and breeder, Chris Fiferek, I hope I'm. Uh, Getting that right donates 10% of Barron's earnings to a nonprofit dedicated to empowering adults on the autism spectrum. You can learn more things about all things Pennsylvania bread racing at pabread.com. Uh, we're going to go to a break and we come back. It'll be time for the Green Group Guest of the Week. The PA Horse Breeders Association introduces the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Four brand new races to be run at parks for PA sired, PA bred two year olds. There are two $100,000 contests on August 22nd, PA Day at the Races. September 24th, PA Derby Day has two more races, each with a $200,000 purse. The PA Stallion Series, yet another reason why Pennsylvania is the premier place to breed and race. For more, please visit pabred.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We're pleased now to welcome in Brad Cox, the man of the hour, fresh off a win by Cyberknife in the grade one Haskell on Saturday at Monmouth. Brad, congratulations. You had talked both before and after the race about how this is not an easy horse to train, that he's sort of been a, a horse that you've had to really roll up your sleeves and get to work with. Can you tell us more and, and you know, to, uh, can you elaborate on that? What, what makes him a little bit harder to train than some other horses you've had? Good morning, Bill, and thanks for having me on. Um, you know, he's just been a horse that, um, you know, kind of when he came into us um, as a two-year-old, spring of a two year old season last year um just a little tough to deal with the horse to tend to when to tend to rear up a good bit and um you know a little reluctant to go to the track and just do his job um and, you know listen you, there there's always a couple of horses in each group that are tough to handle and he definitely was one of them so uh but you know as he's gotten older he has definitely gotten better there's zero doubt about that uh we always felt like you know based off his works his early works and um he, he was a horse with a tremendous amount of talent and um you know, it was just about getting him to put it all together. And, uh, you know, even when he won the Arkansas Derby, we didn't really feel like we've seen the best of him yet. Obviously, I 
dude believed the Kentucky Derby was a complete throwout. So, uh, you know, he, he's a good, he's a very good cult, obviously. He's a dual grade one winner. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, he'll continue to move forward. And, and Brad, you mentioned uh, before we did the interview that you're in a hotel room. Are you in California? Are you in New York? Where, where exactly are you? No, um, my, my wife, Olivia, and, and my son, Brody, we, we, he, our, our goal this summer was to make it to a Cubs game. So we uh, we decided to come up for a Cubs game. We're actually leaving this evening, and uh, we, we was able to go to a Cub game, Cubs game two nights ago and uh, back, back to the ground. To, to, actually, tonight, we fly back tonight, and then uh, – uh, back, back, uh, back at Churchill, and then back to Saratoga actually this weekend. So it's kind of been jumping on a lot of planes this week. Yeah, sounds like it. And, and I thought you were going to say, and we're going to end up in California with with Mandaloon. Talk to us a little bit about the San Diego handicap, and it looks like it's shaping up to be a, a little, a bit of a tough race. Yeah, I think solid enough. But this Colt is trained really well, and uh, leading up to the Stephen Foster, he trained really, really well. Um, thought about going to the Salvatore Mile with him there in Jersey. Uh, we backed out of that with, with uh, just the way the race was coming up with hot rod, Charlie, uh, two turn mile thought they might get away from us a little bit, but, um, you know, we opted for the Stephen Foster. I thought we were a little, probably a little bit too close to a hot pace coming off the layoff. Um, and he obviously hooked a very, very good horse in Olympiad that we weren't quite ready for him. Um, you know, off of a layoff, I should say. So, um, you know, looking forward to uh, getting him, giving him another opportunity. Um, obviously, around two turns, I'm on the 16th, I think suiting very well. Um, you know, th- this whole situation with, with him this summer, obviously, he was delayed getting back to America. Uh, but it, it reminds me a tremendous amount of Nick's go last year. Um, he trained extremely well out of Saudi as well. Then we, we went to the Met Mile. He ended up fourth. Very similar uh, as to how Mandolin performed off that layoff as well. We wrote him back in four weeks just based off of how he was doing. We're doing the same thing with Mandolin, so hopefully it can, you know, jumpstart a, um, you know, a great second half of the year for him. Mm-hmm. Brad, speaking of Mandaloon, he is your 2021 uh, Haskell winner. Now you've won the race two straight years with Cyberknife, but he had to be placed first through disqualification. How much sweeter is it to have a horse actually cross the wire first, or is a win a win? Uh, is a win a win? You know, it was a big performance for Mandolin last year. He was battling back, and we we're you know very proud of his effort. But you know, it's always obviously um, you know in the moment, it's it's. It, it feels a little better to cross the wire as opposed to having to wait for Stewart's decision to say the least. Now, Brad, in, in, in 2020, you got the Eclipse Award for Outstanding Trainer. You repeated in 2021. Um, you know, you've, you've won all kinds of, of great races, you know, and I'm sure any trainer would love to have your resume. Did you have a stated goal for yourself for 2022 based on, was it, you know, on win percentage or winning a specific race or, or, you know, doing more interviews with us. I mean, what, what, were, what were your goals for 2022? Uh, you know, I think it's just to try to capitalize, you know, continue to get better each and every year. And listen, last year was a tremendous season. Our Saratoga run there, the, the Travers, the, the Jim Dandy and the Whitney all one summer was, was a magical season there at Saratoga. And, you know, we, we're, we're, Enjoying the Saratoga meet, we got off to a good start with winning the Sanford. But to think that we're going to have that summer again is, uh, is not, probably not going to happen. Uh, we're looking forward to giving some horses an opportunity to get to the Travers, such as Cyber Knife and maybe Tawny Port. But, uh, you know, last year was a magical year. Um, uh, we, our horses performed extremely well. Um, it seemed like in, in two turn um, dirt races. So uh, that was something that, you know, we're hoping we can build off of and continue to move forward. But, you know, listen, I, I think it's just you, you just want to be relevant, just, you know, be competitive at, at the greatest stake level. And, uh, you know, hopefully some of these horses will develop and and we can uh, be a factor in the Breeders' Cup. But I, I guess to answer your question, you just try to increase your numbers every year. Um, I'm not certain we can um, eclipse the earnings mark that we had last year. Uh, but, you know, we're working every day in order to try to achieve that. Brad, I I was interested in in your answer to that. I was a little bit surprised because is there a point where there's too much? And we we talk about the super trainers and you certainly are are into that category. Um, You know, is there a point where, you know, it's counterproductive to have 300 horses or something like that? Or are are you someone that says, you know, look, I'll I'll take on that responsibility. Um, I can always get bigger. I can always get better. Yeah, I think you got to continue to be. you know, I guess 
hungry for success or, or just, you know, continue to try to develop young horses and, you know, listen, our program, I mean, that's one thing we're trying to do is, is, is with our young horses, get them to the breeders cup, you know, first cup, on you know, Coates, Phillies, turf, dirt. Um, and then, you know, parlay that over to like the Kentucky Derby um, and the Kentucky Oaks. And, and that's what we've tried to set our program up for um, to turn dirt racing. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's going really well. Um, but you know, you, you, it's no secret. I mean, there's strength in numbers and that's, that's the bottom line. You have to have a lot of horses that to, um, to, um, uh, you know, go through and, uh, evaluate. And it's just basically like a training camp, um, uh, for, um, you know, the NFL or, or wherever it may be basketball, you know, it, it, you have to have numbers and uh, you have to have a lot of horses to go through in order to find the ones that are, you know, can make the Derby trail, the Oaks trail, the Breeders' Cup or wherever you're looking for. And, and Brad, you mentioned the young horses and how they're developing. When you go to a yearling sale, what specifically are you looking for, uh, you know, with, with a yearling where you say, that's the kind of horse that I want to train? Well, you know, it, it's tough. The, the sales are extremely, extremely tough. Uh, yeah, you know, for, for me, I, I have to have, have to be working with some agents to, in order to, to shortlist things and to narrow it down. I mean, no trainer can look at, you know, in Keeneland September, 5,000 horses, it's just not possible. So, um, you know, for me, once again, it goes back to trying to find those horses that can compete around two turns on the dirt. That's what we're looking for. Um, a lot of it's based off pedigree and then, uh, you know, the physical makeup, but you know, these horses, uh, and I, I've learned this over the last, last four or five years, they change a tremendous amount from their yearlings, um, for say from September of their yearling season, just to like say January, of their two-year-old start their two-year-old season and then they'll change a tremendous amount in Mar, you know fast forward three months so they're always changing and and i i it's it's very you know tough to see how they're gonna um you know move forward or or, or maybe not move forward you know you're not seeing there's situations where you may not be seeing the horse you saw in September, say in April of his two-year-old season. But, um, you know, you, you have to start somewhere. And basically when we're buying these, these horses as, as yearlings, we're looking at, you know, very um, young horses. And I guess I would relate it to, it's probably like looking like a 12 or a 13 year old kid, hoping that they're going to be, you know, uh, maybe even younger, uh, maybe not eight or nine. And you're, you're doing a lot of your, um, homework based on pedigree and then obviously the physical as well but we really don't, never know how they're going to go which direction they're going to go so brad as you set your sights on the 2023 kentucky derby you have what is arguably right now the best two-year-old colton training most strike uh, won the sanford by three and a half lengths just give a uh, give us your take on him and in general your two-year-olds what does as a group what do they look like um i think we start with most strike i mean he's a nice colt he came out of the two-year old cell and and um really never missed a beat um performed very well at churchill he you know i, I breeze him twice um and both both works before the sanford were um at churchill and, and they were good moves his 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 last move before we shipped him up was a really really good breeze um i like what i saw i think he was a um five eighths in a minute and three uh galloped out one i thought you know this horse deserves a shot at sanford Florent did a good job. So listen, he's a very smart horse. And I, I do think I'm listen, I'm not going to say and tell you he's a model quarter horse, but I do think he's a horse that's going to stretch. And I think he could be a factor in the hopeful. Um, overall, I think we've got a really good group of Colts um, and Phillies, probably a little more Colt heavy this year. Um, I felt like we were a couple years ago with the likes of Essential Quality and Mandolin as well. That group seemed to be a little on the heavy with the Colts and, and it worked out well. Um, and I, I kind of feel that again this year. Um, I'm not going to sit here and give you a bunch of names. Cause I honestly, honestly don't know right now, like the good ones from the ones that are probably just going to be okay. But it seems like a very, very deep group of Colts that, um, you know, I think if all goes well this fall and obviously throughout the winter and spring that, you know, we could hopefully have a presence in the Derby. Brad, we're going to, I want to play a game with you that we've played with, with Pletcher and Asmussen and some of the top trainers that, that you're <laughs> It, it's probably called, be really I mean, bad at it. <laughs> no, nah, nah, you're fine. You're fine. We used to call it who was better, but now we're going to call it who do you like training better? Okay. So okay. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some names of horses that you've had some established horses. Who'd you like better between these two British idiom or Kafefi? Um, boy, this gets in trouble with the owners. With this, you know, you love well, them all. You know, I, I, I'm going to go with, um, Kofefe based off just raw speed. Um, I, I just like that running style. Now, you know, if you, if you asked me before I knew him, I would 
you know, like a Philly that go two turns as well, but just, just raw speed and performance and brilliance. I would have to go with Kofefe. And another thing you're talking about training. It's fun to watch a Philly like Kofefe train just based off how she worked. Her works were amazing. I mean, I, I can remember her work before the test and her work before the, uh, be- before the test at Churchill, before she went up for the race was phenomenal. And she worked absolutely identical um, at Churchill the week before she went out for the Breeders' Cup uh, Billy Mayer uh, sprint. So um, that's that's my answer there. All right, great. Couple couple more. Stay with me. Monomoy girl or she dares the devil? Uh, that's that's uh, that they're both really good. Wor- they were both s- solid workhorses. Um, I would say Monomoy. I'll tell you, she dares the devil's easier to train. Uh, she's very 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 easy to train she uh monomoy could be um maybe a touch challenging early on and um you may not get what you want all the time especially if she worked by herself she was tend to not do a whole lot by herself but um i would say definitely i mean obviously monomoy was was uh was a champion but in, in regards to like maybe it was definitely easier to train it's definitely easier to train as she dares the level okay Let, last one for you this is the big one Knicks go or essential quality? I think that goes back to like maybe, um, I mean, essential quality I had from the start. So that meant a lot to me. He was a horse that stamped himself early in his two year old season as a really good colt. So to see him continue on and get, you know, we, we obviously had him for around a year and a half. Um, um, Knicks go, you know, accomplished a good bit uh, before we got him, or received him. Um, the answer to that would be I, i'm gonna say um i'm gonna say essential quality because he was definitely easier to train next was very forward i uh, would want to do maybe a little too much in his works where essential was a little bit more like mo- bottom white girl where you know to get something out of him of the mornings you had to um put him in company and stuff so i, I would say essential just because he was easier to train great now th- those are excellent answers thanks uh, Brad, before we let you go, let's talk about this weekend. We have Tony Port and Jim Dandy. Uh, obviously, a very, very tough spot, especially for a race that's essentially a prep for another race. Um, give us your take on how he's doing since the Ohio Derby win, and you know what are you projecting for this weekend in the Jim Dandy? Um, he's doing really well. He breezed um, a couple weeks ago on the Oklahoma training track and breezed well. Came back last week, um, would have been a week and a half ago now, and um, He's really, really well on the main track with Irad. And then this past week, he breezed, um, he breezed well. Um, I thought I actually put him in company with Matarea, and Matarea seemed to be going maybe the, a little bit better of the two at the wire, to be honest. But, um, you know, I, I think matching up a, a horse like him that's a true mile and an eighth horse against a filly that's more of a seven eighths of a mile filly or one turn filly, uh, you know, probably wasn't the greatest matchup, but it's what I had to. It's just way, what I had there at Saratoga, and I felt like I needed to get a good work in both of them, and it worked out. Um, he's a good colt. I think he's improving. Um, I know he's improving. Physically, he looks amazing. His coat's good. His color's good. Um, like I said, he's moving great. I think he likes Saratoga. So, listen, I, it's, I'm, I'm hoping that there's some pay, a pace presence. Oftentimes, we don't get that in a short field. But I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, if, if there's some pace and they can, you know, those horses can work on each, each other early, you know, he, he's the type of horse that will, you know, definitely like the mile and eighth and should like the Saratoga surface and hopefully it'll be a factor late. Uh, Brad, thanks so much for all your time. Congratulations again on the Haskell win. Good luck in the Jim Danny this weekend. And we'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Talk to you Thank soon. You. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Guest of the Week, Brad Cox will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select The Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made The Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes.
The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's Workout of the Week features Corniche. Remember him, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile winner, working in company with stakes winner Provocateur, going four furlongs in 48.03 on Sunday at Saratoga. We haven't seen Corniche since his Breeders' Cup Juvenile victory last fall, but he's been putting in works this summer in New York for Todd Pletcher and is going to be running in next Sunday's Grade 2 Amsterdam Stakes. Well, it's that time again. Let's take a look at the major races that are going to be run around the country this weekend. And, John, let's go out to California first with the San Diego, a prep, of course, for the Pacific Classic. And they've got a nice uh, race lining up there. Country Grammar is coming back. He's a 125-pound high weight. It'll be his first race since winning the Dubai World Cup. Mandaloon, last year's Kentucky Derby winner via disqualification. He's going in there for Brad Cox. There goes Harvard, the winner of the Hollywood Gold Cup, will be in that race. An express train, the winner of the San Diego Handicap, he's in there too. Uh, all these horses, if they run well, they'll be back for the Pacific Classic where they're going to run into flight line. But I'm really interested to see what Country Grammar can do. I mean, he's kind of been the forgotten horse a little bit because he hasn't been seen on U.S. soil this year. But then again, he ran two great races, second in the Saudi Cup, wins the Dubai World Cup. Can he beat flight line? I don't think so, because I don't think anybody can beat flight line. But nonetheless, if he comes out of this race with a big effort, um, you know, he's going to be the talk leading up to the uh, Pacific Classic so far as who can beat flight line. And, and Bill, I, I wonder with country grammar, you know, you say he's the forgotten horse. I had forgotten that he's made almost eleven million dollars mm -hmm. in purse earnings. I mean, that which is astonishing to me. Um, uh, granted, 10 million of it was, you know, from from basically from overseas. But. Um, for all intents and purposes, he has been the forgotten older handicap horse. Um, he ran two great races overseas. Both of them were much, much further than the mile and 16th San Diego handicap. And I think that ultimately might be his downfall is the fact that this race is so much shorter than what he's used to uh, running in. Um, there's a couple other horses that, that may run in there. You mentioned Express Train, who won it last year. Mandaloon, who's just, you know, one of the one of the most interesting hard luck Colts that, that, uh, that I've seen in a while. And we can talk to Brad Cox about that. Um, you know, in today's show, um, Royal Ship, who's a Mandela horse, Senior Buscador. Remember him? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, who, uh, who was on the Derby campaign at one point. Um, he looks like that he's a, a possible horse in the race. And, and you mentioned There Goes Harvard. And, and I actually had to do a little homework on There Goes Harvard because he's only run um, or he hasn't run on the East Coast at all. But he was only off the board bill once. And that's when he lost his rider. Every other race that he's run in, he's finished first, second, or third in his career. And yet it's all been in, you know, maiden races, allowance races, kind of uh, undercard stake races. And then he went ahead and won the Gold Cup, uh, you know, earlier in the year. And now all of a sudden there goes Harvard is, is you know, being talked about as one of the top horses out in California, at least. So it's going to be an interesting feel um, based on on who possibly could run in there. Um, and then, oh, by the way, you know, Tripoli. May run also, and all he's done is made nine hundred thousand dollars in in purse earnings. So it, it's going to be a an interesting field, um, to say the least. I think that the only thing that's going to defeat Country Grammar is the distance. Um, but that being said, you know he's he's a horse to watch, and uh, and certainly going to be entertaining racing um, out in California for the San Diego handicap. Right. So let's turn our attention to Saratoga, another big weekend, of course. And the, the highlight of the Saratoga weekend is going to be the Jim Dandy, and you've got uh, right now at least four big name horses lining up for it. Epicenter, who even though he didn't win one of the Triple Crown races, might have been the best horse in the Triple Crown series early on with second place finishes in the Derby and the Preakness. Zandon, Bluegrass winner, third in the Kentucky Derby. We haven't seen him since for Chad Brown. He's not a bad trainer, I, is what I hear. Uh, early voting from the Chad Brown barn is coming back after winning the Preakness. Then Brad Cox has Tawny Road in there. Um, this race is going to go a long way towards shaping the picture for the Travers. Obviously now, Jack Christopher is not going in the Travers. They, they've they already put the brakes on that. He's not going to go a mile and a quarter. So I think you're going to see this race determine who is going to be the favorite in the Travers. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Tawny Road is quite up to Epicenter Zandon or early voting. We'll find out. You know, wouldn't put anything past Brad Cox to win a big race like that. But, um, you know, I, I guess, I, I mean, I haven't seen the past performances yet. I'm still an Epicenter fan. I mean, I, I thought he ran great during the Kentucky Derby uh, and, and Preakness run. And, um, you know, but then again, you know, what's wrong with Zandon? What's wrong with early voting? This will really be a good race. It'll really help clear things up. And uh, come Sunday morning or Saturday evening, we'll have a much better idea of how things look for the Travers. Yeah, and based on the probables, Bill, 
Um, it, you, you mentioned those four and, and uh, Ethereal Road. It looks like that he's going to be the fifth one in, in this group. Um, of those horses, really early voting has the only speed in the race. So it could be as simple as, you know, uh, Ortiz breaks early voting out there, slows the pace way down and just coasts um, in this nine furlong race because he literally is the only speed in the race. Um, Epicenter, I agree with you. You know, I thought he was going to win the Derby uh, and, and midway down the stretch, it looked like he was going to win the Derby. And, and he just had, uh, you know, just because of luck and chance and everything like that, Rich Strike just came up on the rail and, and just barely beat him. Um, Ethereal Road is not the same mm -hmm. as he was, uh, you know, earlier on. And I don't think he's as good as some of these top three year olds, but um, I wouldn't say that he shouldn't run in the race, but uh, there's others that I like better. And, you know, you mentioned Zandon, who he's going to be a fresh horse and he's, you know, nine furlongs hits him right in the head. So if uh, if early voting is this, if a stable mate early voting doesn't get out there on an easy lead, it could set up really, really well for Zandon. And the only thing I'll say about Tawny Port is if you look at his past performances really closely, he ran two of his best numbers with Lasix. So he will not be able to run on Lasix in, in the Jim Dandy. Um, I'm not saying he needs to have Lasix in order to perform well, but his best performances um, are when he's on Lasix. Saturday's card at Saratoga will also uh, feature the uh, Alfred Vanderbilt. Um, both of us, John, we kind of looked up online to see if we could get a, a, a feel for who's going to be in this race. Um, weren't uh, weren't lucky enough to find that out. But you have the headliner. You have a horse that's going to be an obvious favorite, and obvious odds-on favorite is is Jackie's Warrior. And and not that you know uh, he couldn't win anywhere, but boy, does this horse love Saratoga. He's four for four at Saratoga, including what I still think was the best performance of his career when he beat Life Is Good last year in the Allen Jerkin. So um, you know, uh, I assume will be a short field um you know we might be looking at one unfortunately is, is become a fairly commonplace a five or four horse field with a huge odds on favor but nonetheless you know anytime jackie's warrior steps on the racetrack that's a big deal yeah and, and bill i don't even think we're going to get five or six i think it's going to be it's going to be jackie jackie's warrior maybe a local horse and and of course uriah st louis is going to have a horse in there um just to try to get third place but i, I don't know if if put it this way we have nice sprinters in our in our stable and mm -hmm. we wouldn't run any of them against jackie's warrior because you know you're running for second place at right. best um so it is a really really uh you know going to be an interesting card of jackie's warrior and kind of everybody else and it almost doesn't matter if jackie warrior breaks on top breaks second you know breaks last he is such the class of these of this field as far as you know who the probables are um that i think i would just not even bet on the race and just watch it because it, he is one of those generational horses, generational sprinters um, that you just have to appreciate. And and uh, as a fan of racing, you just have to in, enjoy watching him run. Yeah, getting a little ahead of ourselves, but if we're lucky enough to see Jackie's Warrior versus Jack Christopher in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, which is, I assume is where we know Jackie's Warrior is pointing there. I would assume that's where uh, uh, Jack Christopher would wind up. Boy, is that going to be raced? Now, Sunday at Saratoga, the Amsterdam is coming up. Um, not normally a race that's a big deal, but we have to mention this year because we just showed the XBTV workout of Corniche, who's, I mean, talk about a mystery horse, uh, hasn't run since the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, where he completed his two-year-old campaign undefeated, the, the two-year-old champion of 2021 for um, Bob Baffert. He's been moved to the Todd Pletcher barn in part because Baffert um, is not allowed to run in Saratoga. But, uh, you know, without seeing the past performances, yet and not really knowing who's in there. I got to take a stand against this horse, John, because it was interesting when um, when we started talking to the connections, finding out why Corniche had missed all this time and was not in any of the Triple Crown preps, was not in any of the Triple Crown races. You know, they didn't say, oh, he had a chip removed from a knee or something like that. They basically said we weren't real happy with how he was doing and we didn't want to bring him back until we knew he was really razor sharp. That's a little bit of a red flag for me. You know, obviously they must think that he's doing better now or else he probably would still be on the shelf. But the, the whole explanation of his absence, having been away that long. And then the other thing, too, is I, I should have thought of doing the statistics, but the Breeders' Cup Juvenile has been the most anti-key race we've ever seen. I know I, and I did some stats back around June or something and not a single horse had yet come out of that race to win. Since then, I don't, you know, I don't know if that's changed since then, but, um, you know, everything we've seen coming out of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, um, uh, Papa Cap, who was second, he hasn't won yet since then uh, for trainer Mark Cassie. Um, you know, on paper, it looks like that was uh, a bad race. He'll be the favorite because he is Corniche, because he's trained by Pletcher. 
Um, I don't know who else is going to be in there yet, but um, I'm not going to jump on his bandwagon until I see him do something on the racetrack. And Bill, I'm sure that part of the calculus of, of running and, and managing a horse like Corniche is the fact that you want to keep his legacy going. And I know that sounds silly for a three-year-old, but he was undefeated. He did win two grade ones as a two-year-old. He won horse of the, uh, me, uh, the Eclipse Award as a two-year-old, and he was purchased for a million and a half dollars. So I, I think that unless the horse is 100% and really training well, um, they have to protect him and basically try to protect, like I said, his, his legacy and have him continue to be undefeated or at least, uh, you know, campaign him in the easiest races possible until he can step up and has to run against the older horses. Mm -hmm. Because as a stallion prospect, the son of Quality Road um, is good. The female family is not as strong commercially. So he's really going to have to carry the banner for, for that family line. And when you're talking about these kind of dollars as a stallion prospect, um, it, tens of millions of dollars are at stake. I understand why they're taking their time with him. Um, and also that you have to remember too, and you mentioned it, that now he's being trained by a completely different trainer, um, by, by Todd Fletcher. And, um, you know, say what you want, they're both Hall of Fame trainers, but they have different styles of, of getting the horses ready. And, and I think that, um, you know, the powers that be that manage Corniche are taking a very, very critical look as to when can we get this horse 100% and when can we get him running? Because once we get him running, we want him to knock out a couple of series of races before the November uh, races against the, the big dogs, the older horses. Yeah, we shall see. Should be an interesting uh, rendition of the um, Amsterdam Stakes. Hey, the TDN Riders Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. West Point runners had two big works over the weekend, Flight Line owned by West Point and others, got his first breeze in at Del Mar this summer on Saturday, going five furlongs in 59.40 in preparation for the grade one Pacific Classic. And in New York, first captain went four furlongs in Saratoga as he prepares for the grade one Jockey Club Gold Cup on September 3rd. West Point kicks off their weekend of racing on Friday with B. Dock, who will take on Allowance Company in race seven at Ellis Park. Best of luck to him and all the West Point partners this weekend. All the thrills. Fraction of the Bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years of combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Last week, Mrs. Nushi became the latest winning Black Legacy graduate when she broke her maiden at Alice Park. And a reminder that the Keeneland November sale entry deadline is Monday, August 1st, less than a week away. Give Tommy or Wendy a shout to talk about how to get involved. At last year's November sale, their consignment sold 88% of their offerings, including a session topping Philly by Audible. Well, every week we look forward to the cartoons from Remy Bullock. They're just terrific. This week's cartoon, he's got a horse that's acting up and throwing his rider and doing all sorts of crazy things. He said, hey, it's part of my new branding strategy. Isn't everything about branding strategy this day? Well, we want to thank you for tuning into the Writer's Room this week. We also want to thank our crew. I want to thank John Green, Brad Cox, and our staff, Katie Petruniak, Anthony LaRocca, Aaliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson. They're our editors. Of course, Patty Wolf and her whole team. Thank you so much for putting together Writer's Room. We'll see you next week.